afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Becky Metcalf, and on behalf of Design Centre Chelsea Harbour, a very warm welcome to Conversations in Craft. Now, these talks have been specially devised and curated uh, to coincide with Artifact. It's our first contemporary craft uh, fair here, and we're very excited about it. So, um, just a bit of housekeeping. If I could ask you just to turn your phones off, that would be really kind. <coughs> So I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce our wonderful panel today, uh, Emma Craig Miller, who is a journalist and editor of the Design Edit, edit uh, Johnny Messens, who's the founder of Messens Wiltshire, and Sebastian Cox, furniture maker, designer, and environmentalist. And the chair who's, who's looking after us all today is Grant Gibson, podcaster and writer. I think we should give them a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. I'm inclined just to look at you for a while. It's like you're people, you're not a screen. No. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's amazing, it's isn't it? It's, it's crazy. thrilling. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been doing this for a couple of days now and, and I, it's still, it's still really exciting. The first day I was at, kind of just completely blown away by it. It's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for coming. It's a really warm day. You could be doing anything and you decided to sit in a very dark room. So I appreciate that. You also could have been watching it on telly, but so it's great that you're here. Um, we are here to talk about the relationship between craft uh, design and fine art. Um, it's a bit of an old chestnut, but craft has usually been seen as a poor relation to fine art and design. Uh, however, and one of the reasons why we're all here is there has been a huge surge of interest in making in recent years. The question is why, and has it disrupted that perceived hierarchy? However, before we get into all that, I'm quite keen, so that the panel knows who they're talking to, I'm quite keen to know who you are, because you're slightly shadowy dark figures at the moment. But perhaps I can ask a um, show of hands. Are there makers in the room? A couple of very firm yeses. A couple of, oh, somebody came up. Oh, you, yeah, very good. You're waving twice just to make sure I did see you. Uh, designers. Excellent. Uh, media curator types. Well, you're not sure. Uh, oh, you're covering a lot of bases <laughs> over there in the far corner. Um, what else is there? Have I said curators? Have I missed anybody? Architects. Oh, Jones. hello. Uh, I can't. Oh, Crafts Council. I should always, I should always mention the Crafts Council. It's well, lovely to see you. Thanks very much for coming. Um, so now we know who everybody is. Uh, we are live streaming. Best not swear. I think, generally speaking. Um, but to kick off, I was thought maybe Emma, I'd turn to you because you're the bridge. We have Johnny, who's kind of traditionally from the, well, has come from the fine art world. Yep. Um, Sebastian, who, for the purposes of this talk at least, I'm saying comes from the design world, and we can discuss whether you do or not later. And Emma, as far as I'm concerned, you're the bridge between the two. Uh, okay. Good. That's, that's Glad that's you're going fine. with that. Um, okay. So can we talk about the rise of craft? Why, over the past 12, 10, 12, 15 years, has craft become a word that people are happy to use, actually? Well, I think that, that there are two aspects to it, and um, one aspect is the level at which people want themselves to be in touch with making. And I think that probably is a reaction to the increasing level of virtuality in our working lives and our home lives, and that people feel a lack of doing things with their hands and take real pleasure from it, and that attention has been brought to that by things like the Great Pottery Throwdown, um, and other events like that. On the other side, I think that craft has also become fashionable and a focus has been, um, it has been spotlit by auction houses, by fashion houses, so the Loewe Craft Prize with Jonathan Anderson really foregrounding craft as a skill that lies at the foundation of Loewe, but also as a fine art practice effectively. Um, that Grayson winning the Turner Prize didn't um, uh, uh, obstruct <laughs> the, uh, the rise of craft. Well, that was um, that famous quote, wasn't there, where he said that people in the art, I'm going to paraphrase, but people in the art world were more shocked that he was a potter than he was a transvestite. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I think he defined it as uh, being the second class material, a bit like women. That's how he defined <laughs> it at the time. Um, oh, and the world has changed, hasn't it? <laughs> and then, of course, you know, uh, Edmund Duval writing uh, magnificent novels, which are then seen to be seamless with 
these extraordinary mm. pots that he makes, which then again are part of a whole fine art practice with deep conceptual root roots. And so the continuities between craft practice and these other areas of the, of the art, design and fashion world has become more and more apparent. Mm. And so it's no longer been seen as something that only took place in the countryside, in craft shops, has totally been blown out of the water. I mean, it got given a kind of um, an intellectual framework as well, didn't it? Exactly. From Richard Sennett's The Craftsman. Yep. I mean, obviously Edmund writing Hair with the Amber Eyes was hugely important. And the Matthew Crawford book, The Working With Your Hands yes, book, which, which was, I mean, I think yeah. was incredibly influential, kind of bizarrely, on the Conservative Party when they came into government in 2010. Um, I mean, Sebastian, can we turn to you uh, for a moment? And can I talk about your relationship with making? Mm. I mean, it's always been a fundamental part of your practice. Mm. Uh, but I'm guessing when you were coming through college, university, I mean, craft was still at that. Was it, was it, a, was it a trendy thing to do? Was it, was it frowned upon you making making a central, a central part of what you do? Well, <clears throat> I think... I wasn't really aware of what was mm. trendy or fashionable because I was so young at the time. I didn't really understand that. On my sort of personal level, it was a, an opportunity to work with my hands, which I was sort of, you know, being a bit rebellious about academia and wanted a course which allowed 50% making. And actually, at the time, there was only two courses that allowed that. Um, so I sort of stumbled into it and then realized there was this intellectual framework which was emerging as I was going through the course, which was really interesting. And I read Matthew Crawford's book in 2010 when I was studying. Um, and, and did that have an impact on you, that book? Um, I realized that uh, what I, the career that I was embarking on was going to be more than being just a local furniture maker if I wanted it mm. to be. It meant that maybe I could have work in the V&A one day. I think it sort of... And Gareth Neal... Ha, you know, was sort of doing, he was at that uh, point in his career where he was kind of maybe doing the rounds of like university talks, you know, like I did sort of like five years after, because you're really relevant like five years after graduation to, <laughs> to the student audience yeah, who yeah. really need to be dragged yeah. through their course. Putting someone like Gareth in front of them is really effective. And he didn't come all the way up to Lincoln because our course was so small and, uh, you know, uh, not that good. But um, seeing him on, in Crafts Magazine at the time and th those kinds of things, I thought, oh, actually, there's someone who's like a designer here who's actually being taken really seriously for mm. working with his hands by this commercial market. And um, so I think it sort of began to open that up for me as a career that would go beyond just being, yeah, a local carpenter, furniture mm. maker. Mm. I mean, having the workshop, I'm intrigued. I mean, this is really nothing to do with talk. It's just that you're sat there and I've got a microphone so I can ask you these things. <laughs> um, the pandemic, mm. how has that affected the way that you work? Um, the business, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, both, whatever, personally yeah. as well, if you like. Uh, not, not much, really. I mean, I've moved to Margate, and mm. so I'm sort of a bit more remote. Uh, but my, my job is sometimes on the hand tools. Like, a, 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 um, at least once a fortnight, I get thrown into the workshop at the bottom with the apprentice, and I'm sanding wood uh, um, because my job is largely design and strategy and that sort of thing. Um, so it hasn't changed much. I think um, hospitality's fallen out of yeah. our of our offering, mm. although that's really starting to come back very strongly now. There's some people really taking gambles with that. Um, but it hasn't changed much. I think I've always felt like we're quite, because of the craft nature of our business, we are quite resilient. There's a sort of strange thing that's afforded by that. We're not one thing and we are very, uh, you know, we have great dexterity in what we can do because we can make. Mm. Um, I think it's been offered us resilience. It does. I mean, it's also quite an expense. I mean, the whole tooling must be expensive it's, um, it's good. in some ways it's got to be more of a risk isn't it than just sitting on a mac yeah that's absolutely true yes we have overheads to pay um yes and um you know yeah staff and and all of those things um so yes we have had some degree of risk but we've managed to continue trading because mm. you know that, well that's my job keep, keep the show on the road um yeah uh, it's been i mean we've like actually you know bought equipment during the pandemic so it's mm. not you know the bounce back loan has mm. been really good <laughs> yeah. you know so we bought a cnc machine another one um so you know yeah very good johnny can i turn to you yeah and ask about your relationship with craft because i think it's really interesting what's happened at messums i mean you were third generation of a family to work in the fine art world correct um why this conversion and, and you no, have and particularly ceramics i think it's safe to say what why so, this conversion 
Well, fun enough, we started with a um, program in 2016. I've got a 13th century barn, which we turned into an art space. And I was quite influenced, I think it was by Glenn Adamson at the time, who was saying, well, look, you've got to look at art forms laterally. Like, we look vertically in columns of sculpture and fine art and painting. And there really is no ostensible difference. And the point that uh, Grayson was making, really, is that there seems to be this sort of hierarchy situation going on between craft and art. And why is that? And it's the question that you're asking now. And so I set up a, uh, in this barn. We weren't ready. We were late opening, so I thought, well, what can we do? Um, and we set up a summer school with, um, uh, with, with Dave Lindley, actually. And we were doing a wood workshop. I said, I'm really interested to explore what's going on between, you know, what is this difference? And he said, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, I'm one of those people who has to put their finger on the paint which says, don't touch, it's wet, because I'm just innately curious as to understand why. Um, and so that became something of a thing. And obviously, ceramic is our thing. We've, we've programmed on, uh, I think, quite rightly to look at how some really interesting artists are working with this material, mm. but not exclusively. And we should think about other materials in this context as well. Um, and so, I, so for me, it became a question of narrative. Could you have narrative in the object? And if you had narrative, you probably had art. And then I think to Emma's point, you know, what's really happened Sam said as well is that we've really begun to understand what goes into these crafted objects, these works of art in their own right, mm -hmm. better through all the people you just talked about. Um, and so we've got better, better cognitive understanding. So that, to use the is a sort of a levelling up that's mm. going on, I think, mm. between this distinction. But um, I'm, I'm intrigued because you, you talk about talking to Glenn Adamson being a moment, but presumably in something must have, must have, must <laughs> well, it, it has been for most of us at some point. Yeah. But um, uh, presumably there must have been something that led you to him in the first instance. Well, don't forget, um, yeah, I was just innately curious. Don't forget, my family were boat builders originally. We started making boats right. way back here in, in London, on uh, Richmond, not far from here. Um, so I'm always interested in, I was always interested in the hand. And I think, you know, objectively, there is a sense of craftsmanship, of quality that goes in there. And, and so I was curious, as curious about that in mm. one art form as I was another. And I don't think we should be exclusive in judging one alongside the other, is my, is my view. I mean, you had a collector base, or have a collector base, I imagine. Did, did you have to take them along with you? Or did you have to find new people to buy these works you've suddenly shown? Had to find new ones. So I also went to my father and said, look, I think I've found this brand new idea. It's the future of the business. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he disowned you? Uh, yeah, he said, if that's your idea, I think you're on your own, chap. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so we, we did. And, and we've, uh, we've always looked at how things are, are made. Because I think, for me, understanding how something is made gives you a reason for understanding why it was made. And so it's a really important part. And I think our job, if you like, I run a gallery, if you like, I'm the sort of, what used to be the interface in a hierarchical structure of kind of maker, buyer, and us in the middle, and I think now it's much more like a triangular relationship, really, and, you know, we want to know, we want to know about the maker, we, you know, we're interested as buyers, as, as we are galleries, mm. um, so that's what I sort of do, so yeah, we did, we found a wonderful new audience of people who, who shared that thought, mm. um, both makers and, and collectors, yeah. Mm. I mean, Emma, the design edit, which I've written about Johnny in. Indeed. Um, uh, the purpose of that? I mean, cause you, yes. because, because really there you're bringing together craft and yes. design, certainly. Uh, and, and I suppose the thing about the design edit is that... Does it, sorry, can I just ask before, before you... If anybody's does, ever heard of does it. Does everybody know the design edit <laughs> It's website? amazing. Yeah. Uh, a show of hands, one or two... Quite a few. There you go. Well, that's very Converted. interesting because, of course, I, I, don't, I don't know who my, my audience is, but I suppose my intention with, that when asked to edit it um, was to create a platform where I could foreground the astonishing work being done across craft and design without having to ask the question the whole time is this art? In other mm. words, I wanted to be able to talk about what these objects meant, how they were made, their place within a kind of cultural conversation, without necessarily having to talk about the hierarchies. In mm. other words, I did want to do it laterally. I mm. wanted to go in and treat with equal attention objects made of glass, objects made of wood, and also sometimes we feature objects that I know count as sculpture. But I feel that so much of the meaning of that piece of sculpture 
is to do with its making. Mm. And I suppose that, you know, I'm, I'm fairly careful not to encroach on painting, and I'm not making a claim for, this, for these objects all to be like Rembrandt's. You know, in other words, I'm just saying these objects are, are serious, they speak to our culture now, they have deep roots, the making is fascinating, these materials have meaning, and to develop more of a critical language, I suppose, about these, uh, these objects in a, on a, in a media platform. Mm. Because I suppose my frustration was that one was only ever able to talk about, for instance, beautifully made furniture as kind of like a nice sofa for an interior. Or, and pots was a bit the same. And it's how yeah. do you find a place in the media where these objects can be written about um, in their own in their own right, yeah. really. Well, I mean, it's true, isn't it? Because if you look at, I mean, there aren't that many architecture correspondents on the national press, oh, or des sounds. architecture and design. But architecture does. But have they only ever talk about architecture. Yeah. Rowan really. So, yeah. Rowan or, only uh, ever talks about architecture. Eddie Heathcote, you, you know, yeah. he, it, it's most, or d or the other kind of design. What I call, I know for you they're not separate, but for, for me it always seems slightly the other kind of design, which is the very cerebral, uh, you, you know, kind of thinking about design and product design. Whereas I suppose because my background is very much in writing about craft and art, it was from that perspective that I was interested in the crossovers between design and particularly the sort of designer maker end of things, mm. where you're making objects, where part of the provocation for the making of the object is function, mm. um, and then crafted objects, but of a very, you know, I mean, I can, years and years ago, I remember just being sort of gripped by the work of Hans Coper and thinking, you know, why is it that a pot can be so full of meaning? You know, how is mm. it and why is it? And, and those questions still fascinate mm. me. Why and is it that a pot can be so full of meaning? Uh, because something of your spirit or chi, I suppose, goes into it as a maker and it resonates through time to you as a present person. That object has um, a life form, effectively, and that's what you're responding to. Yeah. There are broader things like aesthetics, so the sort of volumes which appeal to the eye, and those are more universal than we you know, let on, really. Um, and they mean something. They might mean references to other people's collections or to people who recommend it to you. Um, and it becomes valuable and significant. So if it's relaying a story, a narrative, that connects you in some way and informs your understanding of the world, it's relevant mm. in my book. Can we talk about price? Definitely. Good. <laughs> because, I mean, presumably when you took the step to move into clay, particularly, I mean, you're immediately saying that you're... You would get your pieces were likely to hit lower price points. And how do you get those price points? How do you raise those price points? Um, well, I, th I think firstly, at, and and uh, at that point, certainly, and, and arguably still now, even Hans Koper. I mean, some of the most expensive. I think the most expensive ceramic to date is Magdalena Rodondo. Yes. It's yeah. quarter million pounds. But, but we're only talking about a handful, right? I mean, it's, well, it's mm, a handful. Yeah, it's a handful. So you could, uh, you know, you could say that there is still a huge degree of, of difference in terms of price in comparison um, if price is your metric. And I think there is an argument to say that it does have a way, a, a, a reference. But I think you would turn to your buying audience, you say, well, look, this is something fantastic that you could have in your life for what is reasonably, compared to other options that you might be considering, a you know, small sum of money. Mm. So this is a terrific thing to be buying. What could you get with it? That's a wonderful thing. Um, so I think Price has that bearing, um, and we, you know, but we don't have. We have better ways, but we have shorthand ways. And one of the shorthand ways that we judge <coughs> worth is by price. And you know, we're trying to train ourselves out of that a bit. But, at the but end you're of the a commercial gallery. I mean, but price has to be important. Price is a good doing. thing, and also don't forget, you know, buying things is the best uh, validation you could possibly give for someone. It's the best honour you could possibly give a maker is to go and buy something from them. It means something. Um, and that maker's going to use their money for good endeavour as well, I'm sure. Mm. Um, Seb's doing wonderful work expanding coppices down here. I don't think there's a salient maker or, frankly, a gallery which is going to be around in the future which hasn't thought about its social footprint and consciousness in terms of what capitalism, for that point, uh, may mean. 
Um, so, yeah, there's, uh, I would encourage everybody to, yeah, own these things because they connect you to your point about ant mm. I mean, one of the things, uh, craft gets connected with food mm. quite a lot, the food revolution, uh, the importance of provenance, how and where things are grown, mm. how and where things are made. I mean, it's quite loud in here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We're on a flight <laughs> path. It seems to be. I mean, there's railways, there's helicopters, there's planes. <laughs> anyway, let's ignore that for the moment. I'm going to talk very yeah. loudly across the stage to you. Go for it. Food has played a very important mm. part in, in your practice as well, right? Mm. And, and, and how do you marry the two, food and craft, up? Well, <clears throat> um, actually, they come from a pl the same place in the sense that... Mm. Um, I've sort of had a realization, and I think sort of to the early, early origins of the question, you know, wh where does this all come from? I think there's a, a, uh, a kind of maybe a suspicion of the globalization and the, the point that we've got to in society. You know, I sometimes feel like we're all like on top of a, we've built this massive tower and we're all on the top of it, and we're swaying in the wind and we're sort of going, you know, you know, it's a bit scary up here. And I think there's a sort of a rooting down to earth that happens sometimes. Mm. And that's happening with food as well as objects. And I think for me personally, like I, I like the relationship between design and craft because it gives you the opportunity to look at the kind of macro through the design lens mm -hmm. and then the micro and the very human through the craft lens. And, um, and I'm interested in um, you know, how we use our land and, our, and where our resources come from. And all of those things stem back to, you know, ultimately land is used for, for, for our needs in terms of food and fiber and all of that stuff. So there's a, there's a strong connection for me in that exploration of how do we live our lives, where do we get the stuff from, and how can we do that uh, in this century? Because that's an extremely yeah. pressing issue. Absolutely. How can we do it in this century? Um, just wasting less, consuming less. Um, you know, I think you know, there's a very common thing, which is that people say, oh, well, what's the point? China's got a billion people, but actually the West consume much more um, th than, than the developing world does, the developed world. You know, consumes and wastes massive, massive amounts more. So, uh, yeah, it's about finding you know land efficient ways of living mm. and working. And actually, you know, you can look at that yeah, again. The great role of design, I think, was also it's somewhere between like science and art as well. It sort of has a hard and a soft edge. And design is fantastic yeah. for looking mm. at maps and graphs and data mm. and charts. And then craft offers you that opportunity to sort of focus in on how we have a haptic or a emotional connection with our mm. world and answer, begin to answer some of those questions through the things we make and cook and, mm. you know. And sort of fewer, better things. Fewer, to, better to, things to, is, it, is kind of the answer. It, 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 right across both mm. food and design and making. Absolutely. Yeah. I wouldn't limit the number of things just as a retailer. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> 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 but I do think you should think about how they're produced, i.e. sustainably, yeah. mm. uh, which is really key, which I know is what you're saying as well. But I mean, you must believe fewer things on a macro scale, right? I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not fewer things from your gallery, of course. You know, I, I, yeah, I, we, we sell dining tables that will last you your entire lifetime. Mm. You know, just in the nature of buying a solid wood table, mm. we offer a refinishing service when your children leave home, if you're worried about, <laughs> yeah. if you're worried about that. And we do like a barber wax jacket style, you know, send it back, we'll, we'll repolish it for you. And, and you can do that infinitely with a solid wood table. And it's like yeah. there's little differences to your life. And it's a um, fantastic material. Mm. That's the yeah, key I mean, thing, yeah. you know. We're yeah. not here to talk about wood, thankfully, because otherwise... Yeah, yeah, we... <laughs> well, we, we well you're into wood we, as we, well. We certainly can, yeah. Oh, yeah, we certainly can be. Um, I guess my question to all that, and I don't disagree with you, but if you look at the, the way the food world has gone, which is, you know, you have a group of people who are very much into provenance and are willing to spend lots of money on the right kinds of food that's made in the proper way and where the animals are treated well. But on the other side, you have fried chicken joints opening on every street corner... And I'm just wondering mm. how one democratizes some of these ideas. I know you have William Morris, yeah, William um, Morris exactly. um, <laughs> pinned on your wall. And, and, and whilst uh, he was a, you know, an interesting thinker and a, a, a socialist, I mean, the irony with William Morris, and it's, I'm certainly not original saying this, that all his work were only bought by wealthy people. Mm. So my question is how? How do you take these ideas so that everybody can afford it? Yeah, well... Or is it important? That everybody well, yeah, no, it is important because I think, actually, when you start to... I mean, you can break it down into an economic question if we're talking, you know, we're well, we sustainability to, here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and there, there are good studies which have looked at this on different levels, but generally, cheap, fast stuff costs us in the long run, mm. right? So, mm. so you, if you look at food, uh, the chicken shops... That, that food is cheap at, the, cheap at the point of purchase, but ultimately the cost of the NHS in 40 years' time, um, the cost to 
you know, in, in some Transport cases... Transport it across. Well, yeah, and in yeah. some cases, you know, water boards are paying mm. farmers not to spray nitrogen on their crops because it poisons the water. Yeah. You know, if you actually invert the burden of cost yeah. to yeah. what it should be, yeah. then that food is no longer cheap. Um, and so I think and that does apply to objects too. So I think proper structures, you know, I think we, there's a sort of like a, a kind of a, a thing which is like, you know, we live in a world where we have a fairly free market, but it's regulated. And it's just a question to which you do that in order to balance things mm. up so that it is a world which doesn't do damage to people and nature, you know. Um, so I don't believe it has to be expensive is my, is my well, Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I mean, I, I, this is quite possibly off the point, but, it, but it's intriguing, and I don't expect to have any answers coming necessarily from here, but it's, I, I just wonder how you go about persuading people that that's the right thing to do. Price. Because, because ultimately, you're going to just put people's uh, fried chicken up in price, mm, and they won't vote for you. Um, well, well because, because we're, first of all, we're running out of time, and it is becoming, you know, the way we inhabit this earth is becoming one of our most pressing, pressing issues, and if you look at the cost that it will have in the medium and long term, then it is unjustifiable, the cost of yeah. passing that onto the bird, uh, burden onto the future generations. So um, there's kind of a, a point at which we have to tackle it. Added to which, you know, there are, you know, we're sort of straying off into macro questions, but like, yeah. uh, there, there are like solutions to the world's problems today, which are becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So there are like, you know, technological advances and all those sorts of things which become cheaper and make parts of it more democratic which can help it, you know, mm. help things become more democratic. Mm. You were wanting to jump no, in. No, no, I just, just to, to drive that point home, really, that, you know, you, things like solar power were more yeah. expensive mm. now, but you've got a typical, it's called a Sorber curve, which is basically when it drops like that, as soon as you've got a parity, you'll have a flip. So mm. to Seb's point, really, you know, fried chicken, to use your analogy, is incorrectly priced. That's all. Yes. Um, and you're probably, therefore, disadvantaging people who are using better things. Um, because their product's coming out more expensive, where probably shouldn't be. Mm. So you have to adjust that value. And once you get a kinetic volume of people using those other products, they're going to come down in price as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I think, I think you so know, a degree of subsidization of those things which are doing good and a degree of tax on those things yeah. which are doing bad is the way that society has gone yeah. you know, in the last few years with you know, whatever it is, smoking or whatever. There's like a, there's, there, there are ways of nudging. You know, it's nudge theory is the idea, isn't it? And, yeah. you know, and, and um, that, that can happen you know, at a, at a level of, you know, people like me, small practices, you know, you, you try to have influence and, and encourage that, which, as you say, Johnny, you know, creates an economic drive to then do more of it and the thing snowballs. Yeah. Okay, good. It's fantastic. I made my own fence just recently watching Instagram for free of Seb splitting <laughs> hazel. <laughs> yeah, and I've got tons of old hazel because anyone who lives in the country. My you husband's know, done the same thing. There Land we go. our vegetable patch. There we go. You see, yes. and that's just saved a whole <laughs> ton of people buying fencing. My influence. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. You see, you are going to solve the world's yeah. problems. There we go. Right, right here. Hazel fencing. Yeah, and yeah. Instagram. Yeah. And also on the you know the rise of craft question, I think we have to acknowledge social media there. Well, as well. yeah. Can we talk it, about yeah, that actually? Exactly. Can we talk about the yeah. role of technology in craft? Because mm. I think it's quite mm. intriguing. I mean, how important is has Instagram? been to you beyond helping Johnny make his fence. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of my greatest achievements. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a CV um, polisher right there. Is, isn't it? <laughs> um, Instagram has been absolutely incredible in the, in the last kind of five years. I think uh, it was Twitter, it was before that, you know, getting going with that. I mean, I, I didn't ha like, I didn't study at the RCA. I often get introduced on panel discussions as an RCA graduate, which is quite Yes, quite which interesting. is interesting, right? Yeah, I went to Lincoln Uni, and I felt very disconnected from that world seeing Gareth on Crafts Magazine, I thought, how can I be mates with Gareth Neal? You know, how can I get in there? And Gordon, Gordon Baldwin went to Lincoln. Really? Okay. Well, they never told me that. You know, it was, that they, there was, just, it was just this course that was kind of, yeah. felt very detached from everywhere. So social media was great for me to connect with that world because, you know, it's clicky, you know, mm. and, um, uh, you know, finding a way in there was, was good. So it's democratised that. The ability to show your work, you know, I mean, we are actually thinking about not doing trade shows anymore because, you know, we can save £20,000 mm. a year mm. <laughs> by mm. just making sure that we connect with people on Instagram. So it's, it's seismic in terms of that. And the essence of it is that actually you don't need to show finished product to have a really interesting feed. Um, yeah. You show process. And yeah. that's, again, yeah. why craft has been so important mm. um, because yeah. getting into people's workshops is what people really want to do, isn't it? Yeah. I don't absolutely. know what you think about 100%. that. 100%. Well, I mean, to your point, absolutely, and that's very, very much a thing. And you have as well, haven't you, in your talks programmes of 
Yeah. Of the fashion. Of the fashion. Yeah. I mean, are your, are your collectors, I mean, what, what age are your collectors? Are they plugged into Instagram? Are they yes. listening to podcasts? Uh, is that encouraging them to buy? Yeah. No, we've, yeah, we're 70% we're female, if that's a bearing. We are 35 to 65 age group, mm. on, on average. Um, and we've got something like whatever it is, 20,000 followers across three platforms. So, um, and they, people are very interested in process, as are we. I mean, I don't think yeah. there's any um, reason to do anything else if you're trying to explain something to show someone how it's made, as I said. Mm. Um, and frankly, it's easier than write, reading nowadays. I mean, you know, back in the day, you'd have a worthy art critic who'd write you a long piece of text to explain what this person was trying to say. And now you can just ask him. So mm. it seems much more <laughs> sensible to me. Um, so, um, Although it's that intellectual framework that the art world has developed. And there's that, I mean, we're talking about, uh, it's worth looking up. I mean, you might not agree with everything he says by any stretch of imagination, but David Starkey gave quite an interesting uh, mm. lecture at the yeah, Goldsmiths a couple of years ago where he talked about how our perceptions of art and craft and, and design uh, uh, formed from the, the, Greek, the ancient Greeks and Romans who divided the world up into the fine arts and the sordid arts. And painting, or use of your hands, was um, categorized as the sordid arts, in other words, things that slaves did. And so his contention is the fine arts have spent all that time since then desperately trying to create an intellectual framework to get to justify themselves <laughs> being, painting in particular, being a fine art. Wow. Um, so that, that intellectual framework is possibly quite important. Well, I think I well that's exactly yeah. what Edmund, for instance, yeah. Edmund de Waal, uh, uh, um, has done. Sorry, w uh, on that, uh, I interrupted Johnny, but in mm. terms of that contrast, you mean, between the sordid arts and mm. the... Um, uh, well, the intellectual framework, the intellectual Is frame that what you're trying to do, I wonder, with, with Design Edit? Um, no. Uh, well, <laughs> yes. Yes, I suppose that's true. Yeah. I mean, I think, though, also, we just want to interest people in process mm. as well. And... So we have films, for instance, we realized very quickly that text itself wasn't going to do anything, that pictures are the main draw of our magazine. I'm fully aware of that, having never really thought too much about images before, you know, being a writer. Now I'm aware that the, it's the pictures that get people in and that bring them in. And also the moving image and talking to artists directly. So we do more of that. So we have lots of films on our site. We do in the studio when we can. Um, and we also have an Instagram feed, and I'm very aware that people are drawn to our site for all kinds of reasons. And the intellectual framework is more an attempt, I suppose, to articulate some of these ideas um, so that an initial, I think, instinctive enthusiasm we have for materials and objects and making it, it, it is then recognized and acknowledged to be part of a, an important cultural conversation. Mm. And it's partly, uh, you know, talking to Barnaby Barford, for instance, he says, I think mm. through making. That's what yeah. I do. And it's mm. just enabling people to understand what that means and that this is a, an important form of thinking. Mm. And paradoxically, we do that through words. But, um, you know, that it, it, it's to try and articulate that, yeah. really. Which is which is an art form in its own right, isn't it? I mean, I always think, I mean, I just think it's so strange that we've kind of limited ourselves to these sort of outlets. I mean, we talk about people who are oh, dyslexic. Well, what do you say? I can't find a way to communicate with the rest of the world through the chosen channels, which is either verbal or written, you know, and there's so many other ways of using a language. I mean, I, you know, I can think of extemporizing it, and I hope I haven't kind of lost the thread on this one, but this is where I think about it. It's like, it's just like a language. It's a, it's a way of talking about things, expressing it through objects, and that's for me mm. where, you know, that's why, we're not going, oh, let's go and look at the maker because it's mildly entertaining to watch something being made. It's because actually, you're, you know, he's communicating in some way, they're communicating or she's communicating in some way. I mean, there, there are occasions, one has to say, uh, I don't know how you feel about this, Sebastian, but when, I think it was about 2007, 2008, when Kraft had its <coughs> kind of a, a, a real burst, and I think the, in Milan there'd been the Kraft Punk exhibition the year before, um, uh, which it, it showed people making things really for the first time because generally you'd go to Milan at that point mm -hmm. and you'd see finished products, bloke, woman in a suit trying to flog you, you know, furniture, trendy furniture for your hotel. And suddenly you saw these people making things with leather offcuts. And so the year after, it was everywhere. <laughs> and and th there, is a, there is an element sometimes, this performative 
thing, and talking about process is great, but I, I see it occasionally and think you're treating them like a, like a performing animal in some ways. I yeah. mean, I don't know, do, do you ever find that? We get that a lot with TV approaches, mm. um, fetishization of like hand tools and yeah. things like that to try and, that, that, that there's a sort of a mistake that that is what it's about, you know, and, and um, <clears throat> you know, we, we often say no to those things or we explain and take editorial control of that bit and try and communicate that. But yeah, we, we, we do find that there, there is that element to it. We, uh, but I think that's a sort of a vicarious thing, isn't it? And I, I think this is the, the essence of it all, is that we are, we are ultimately all makers. We've all descended from that ability to do it. There was, you know, we all mm. hold those innate skills somewhere to, to make things. And um, uh, I think when you see someone doing it, there's a little maybe part of your deep subconscious which connects with you being doing that. And um, we, you know, we, we have like courses in the workshop where people can come and, uh, you know, and I'm very aware that part of that is like it's a live show when I'm doing the demo and then it's them then like trying to learn that task. And um, it's, a, it's a very rich experience sharing that mm. through doing and um, showing, yeah. Mm. Yeah, we had courses where, um, and still do, where, you know, you come along just for a day, we would carve an ore or something. And mm. honestly, it's, it's like someone's found a whole kind of chapter of their life that has that previously the door had been closed on. It's mm. extraordinary. And I think there's this lack of hand. I th we were talking about it earlier, maybe just prior yeah. to, you know, the use of your hand was so digitized and so yeah. screen orientated mm. that but we forget. I, and this. I did even that think right? it's, it, it's that. I mean, I'm very aware that having been through, uh, you know, a, 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 having taken a very academic route, I do feel a bit like I've got these absolutely useless things on the end. I mean, they do type. But that's about it, Come you know. Come and do a and dovetail box making work. <laughs> yeah. We'll do one. There we go. Um, Teach you how to cut dovetails. I, I, and so I there's do a real danger of for, for a writer in that. I was once <laughs> asked by Cockpit Arts years and years ago, I think I'd just taken over Crafts Magazine, and my friend was the PR, and she invited me to do a celebrity pot-off. Uh, <laughs> okay. And um, who was it? Um, it was Linda Barker off the telly, and um, a couple of other famous people, fashion designer, um, fashion museum, help me. Where's that pink? Why am I? Uh, uh, yes, Sandra Rhodes. Sandra Rhodes, thank you. This trouble yeah, with lockdown, well. my brain has just gone completely <laughs> mushy. I've just yeah. forgotten everything. And and this this other woman who I think was a trustee. And um, it was well, it was a it was a funny old half hour of my life. It was a bit like um, uh, the Generation Game, where you got shown how to do <laughs> something, and then, the and then you had to do it in in yeah. like two minutes. I remember thinking Alexis Sale turned up in the audience, and I turned to my friend, the PR, and said, "Can you not get Alexis Sale to do this? Because like he's famous and I'm not." <laughs> anyway, what I'd of course forgotten is that Zandra Rhodes and uh, uh, Linda Barker have, had done foundation and mm. I stood there and I was doing all right and then that thing just fell apart in my hands and I looked up and Linda Barker in particular because we were wearing these kind of apron things there wasn't a spot of clay on her I was covered <laughs> and she had this beautiful pot Zandra Rhodes had this beautiful I just had this shard mm. so after that I was, I was like trying things in front of people I'm not doing that again I, I remember they once mm. they took a press uh, doing a press thing with Ndidi Akubi uh, uh, um, yes, Akubia. Akubia. Yeah. And she showed us how to hammer a silver spoon. And I've still got that spoon. Amazing. It was just, I just spent two hours hammering this, this spoon. And you and still got it. And I've still got it. Yeah. You know, it that is, is interesting that. I am digressing a little bit because, yeah. I, because I have seven minutes and 33 seconds left according to this screen. Um, this rise of craft, the success of craft, the fact that craft is now in places like Chelsea Harbour where we all are. Um, is there a danger that the word craft is being abused. It is turning up everywhere. At the moment. St Starbucks, you have, a, you have a crafted experience at Starbucks. Abuse of craft, is that something we should worry about? Mm, yes. Um, I think that's something which, I mean, Gareth wrote a good article for you in Crafts Magazine you about did, kettle, yeah. chips. kettle chips. Yeah, yeah. Which is really, the idea of hand-cooked crisps, I thought was quite funny. Um, yeah, I, I think it probably is. I think that was more of a threat a few years ago. I think we've kind of... I think people are, since the, there was a sort of, um, you know, an interest in sustainability, then there was the realization about greenwashing a few years ago, and now we've got back to a position where that's become a very important topic again. So I think people are aware of marketing spins, and, and I think that, again, social media offers you the opportunity to really interrogate, mm. and I think mm. that that is one of the things, it's so apparent, you know, to tell whether someone is genuinely practicing this with passion, you know, with interest, with intellect, 
just by having a look at their Instagram feed. You know, mm. it's so easy to see through it That's these days. That's really interesting. Um, so I, I'm not so worried. I mean, it is a threat, but I think it's one that we can contain. Do you agree with that? Well, I do, actually. I mean, there was that stage where, for instance, also all the luxury businesses co-opted the word craft um, in order to enhance the value of, of luxury. And it was so abused, the word, that it became almost unusable. Mm. Um, I, just on that, it was because that's quite an interesting thing. That was a thing that was sort of happening. But I had a massive commission from Burberry as a result of that. So mm. there was a sort of a, there was a co-opting, but there was also a degree of embracing of, you know, I would have never had that opportunity had that that's not happened. That's true. So there, there, it's a, sorry to interrupt no, you. No, no, but I but think, I think that's right. And I think that it did have that double mm. uh, effect, which is on the one hand, there was a danger if, if badly followed through mm. of, of diminishing the value of the word. But on the other hand, there was investment recognition. You know, Hermes started to, to bring out the names of the people who were actually wor making the work. Um, but I think that now, um, I mean, I still use the word craft because I feel that to skirt around it is to devalue what it, what mm. it is, you know, to, to sort of it, it, try and use words like studio or, I, I mean, in other words, to feel embarrassed about the word, I think doesn't help it. Mm. Um, and I think now, as you say, there are means of interrogating mm. the integrity of the use of, of the word. I mean, the handcrafted sandwich from M&S is a sort of, you know, is the worst. Well, there was a point, wasn't there, where, where everything had to be Irish, and you, you suddenly had Irish sandwiches. <laughs> like, like, they make a sandwich different over there? How does that work? And then it became craft's turn, mm. it seems mm. to me. Mm. I mean, I just wonder, the abuse of, of craft, I mean, do, do you find galleries, other art galleries, kind of not... Using using craft in a way that maybe you don't approve of. Oh God, no! I never. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go down that road. I think um, you've got a question of um, the difference between craft and art, which I think is the sort of topic of mm. where this is where this is running. And um, I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I think uh, I think it is overused. So I personally wouldn't use it because I think there is better gain by having conversations about the reasons why things are made just in general, regardless of whether you're a potter, a ceramicist, or... Um, so it's all art to you? It kind of, well, for me, art always has been it, really, and I, 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 never, really see, I never really saw the split, um, nor do I subscribe to David Saki's view of this sort of clambering for the top of the tree situation, um, because I think there's language in so many things. I think there is a distinction between things which are crafted, which don't have mm. narrative, but are beautifully made. Mm. Um, uh, but other than that, uh, for, for me, so I would, I would stay clear, because it's, it's such a, a muddy water, for the reasons that you've all you've right, right It does say. matter to people, though, doesn't it? I mean, because I, I often sit there, I mean, all the magazines I've ever edited, and in fact, everything I've ever done, has always tried to encompass every element. And actually, that becomes quite a difficult sell for people. It's too much for them to take, seemingly. And people yeah. like things to be cut. De they do. Up, I can't decompartment. Mm. No, compartmentalize. That's the word I'm trying to spit out. Mm. Um, so, I mean, is it possible to break down these walls? Uh, is this what you're trying to do with the design edit? I think. And it is it working? Uh, if you are. I think we. I think that is one of the things we're trying to do. I slightly backtrack on the, on the use of the word craft because it's true that we go an awfully long way to talk about objects, we talk about, I in other words, we, uh, we talk about makers rather than saying that, yeah. because if you use the word a craftsman, that does encompass people who work with real ambition, but it also encompasses the artisan. And if you then start to introduce a, a hierarchical nomenclature, it seems to me that does a service to nobody. Mm. So I try to just make sure that in each instance, I'm looking at the most interesting work. And that's irrespective of whether it's a, an object that has been handcrafted, a designed object that's been handcrafted, or a design object that's been machine made, or a designed object that's been sort of um, manufactured or a crafted object that belongs within one discourse and then one that appears somewhere else. I think it's looking at those objects each for their own 
in their own right and for mm. their own qualities mm. and just always only trying to focus on the best and most interesting. Mm. Mm. Have you ever had anybody refuse to go on the site? No, not so far. I do remember once, years ago, not on the design edit, but years and years ago. Oh, yes, I think the... Um, no, not with the design edit, because our, par you know, our parameters are so clear. I have had problems in the past, Sheila Hicks. Oh, really? You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> it might even have been She didn't you. want to go in crafts, her people at least, exactly. didn't want her to go in crafts. She, the uh, point blank uh, refused, because, wow. exactly. because that's fine art and there's more money there, and if I get yeah. seen there, in the, that world view, and then my piece becomes yeah. and, meaning something And else. one or two other very fine artists whom I highly respect who work with craft processes and organic materials, glass and so on, um, were not keen on me writing about them in crafts. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. So, yeah, people do like to compartmentalise. It's sad, but true. And that's, that's money and perception as much as anything. Um, according to my, my mm -hmm. screen, we have 14 seconds left. Uh, and uh, this, this running gag I've been doing all week, apparently my chair goes back, a bit like Graham <laughs> if we overrun. Um, so just really quickly, since you've given up your time for nothing, and I really appreciate it, maybe you can plug something that you're doing that people can go and see or do or buy from you. If oh you gosh. want, you don't have to. No, 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 I, just, I, I think just carry on exploring the stories behind why things are made, because there is a revolution that's going on out there with some really interesting minds thinking about how we're going to connect with the planet. And a lot of them are artists, and a lot of them are craftsmen. Very good. Emma, something you want to tell the world to go and read or see or do? Uh, please read the design edit. Um, and yes, just go out there and be curious about every object, you, uh, every object you, f you find, every work you find, and follow the stories. Yeah. Everybody's being so selfless. Is it, have you got something you want people to buy or plug or, you know? I was going to just take away um, an insight. Material Matters with Grant Gibson is an excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, uh, um, we are starting to open up our open house again. We used to do a, a thing before lockdown, which is that we get people, invite them to come and have a look around the workshop um, and uh, see our studio and our workshop, which is based in southeast London. And we're starting to do that again uh, later this summer, which will be a really nice thing to sort of get people physically into the space. Physically into a space. Yeah, come, well, and, come, and, come and see the tools and all the dust and all the nice people making nice yeah. things. Very and good. Actually, to that point, you're absolutely right. Sorry, we have set up a clay I you studio. A <laughs> I'm going to say it very quickly. There you are. So if you wanted to uh, enterprise and have a go, we've got a summer long series of courses in one and two days for people who'd like to learn about making in clay. Very good. And if yeah. you're keen on physically being in a space, as you already know, there is a show going on downstairs. Tell your friends. It's on to the 29th, Artifacts. If you're at home, Artifacts is on until the 29th at the Chelsea Design Centre. Um, all that remains to me to say is thank you so much to the panel for your time. I really appreciated it, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming because it's such a joy to see physical people in a physical space. <laughs> I've had a blast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a huge subject. Gosh, materials, objects, making, cultural conversations. There's so much function. Um, goodness me, human element. But doesn't it all resonate? Doesn't what we're talking about resonate and connect us? And that's what these talks are all about. Seb, uh, thank you so much for coming along. Thank you, for all our panel, for being here. It was a delight. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.